May I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please take a seat. Before we uh, begin together, if you would take your bulletins and turn back to that second reading from Hebrews. I really want to focus on that text today together, and I want to read that text together as we uh, examine it and dive into it. Part of the reason why I decided to focus on this text from Hebrews uh, today instead of the gospel is, uh, one, we've, we're on the track during the summer of readings in which we get consecutive passages, and so we get to explore texts in their deeper and fuller context and mine them for more meaning. The second reason that I chose this text this Sunday is because we studied the book of Hebrews together last spring in adult education in part of our effort to bring Bible study back to St. Luke's. If you want to be a part of that, we're going to be doing it again this spring on Zoom, so just let me know if you're interested. One of the things that really became apparent as we dove into this text together and read it verse by verse, chapter by chapter, from start to finish, is how important context is when reading and interpreting Scripture. As a group, when we were studying this together, we really got a sense of how the author of the letter to the Hebrews was stacking their argument, layer on layer, in order to fully convey and deliver a message. In some ways, pulling a passage out of context like our lectionary does, it highlights the most beautiful passages in Scripture, certainly, but we also lose a little bit of the clarity and meaning and surroundings of what we're actually reading. So if context is so important for this text, then what is it? It's important to know that when you're reading the letter to the Hebrews, that the author of this letter is most likely a, a Jewish Christian, someone who was raised Jewish but converted to Christianity, uh, and was writing to Jewish Christians possibly in Rome, more broadly speaking, in the larger Roman Empire. Though tradition attributes this letter to Paul, it's most likely not his, uh, his writing. But in this context in which the letter is being written, persecution is heating up for Christians. It costs something to decide to follow Jesus. And for, in particular, Jewish Christians, this choice is becoming more and more difficult to maintain. This is due to a particular reason. In the Roman Empire, Judaism was considered a venerable uh, spiritual tradition, an ancestral tradition that was protected. Christianity, on the other hand, was a new upstart and it uh, was not protected and was in, even considered a form of, of atheism at the time. And so for believers who had experience with the Jewish faith, with the Hebrew scriptures, and with that entire tradition, it became a very tempting possibility to just simply slide back into their old way of being, to return to what they knew, to what was familiar, and to what was safe, instead of perpetually putting their life and their family's life on the line for this relatively new faith. The author of the letter to the Hebrews is desperately imploring their readers to not give up hope, to not surrender their faith, insisting that they have the real thing. The author spends the first half of this book essentially setting up Jesus in comparison to all of these figures that are revered in Jewish tradition, Moses, the angels, the patriarchs, and showing all the way down the line how Jesus fulfills the law and God's purpose in an even deeper and fuller and meaningful way, that they would be indeed losing something if they abandoned Jesus. The author uses the long genealogy of faithfulness present in our scriptures in order to encourage their readers to say, hang on, all of these other folks were able to continue on and run the race with faithfulness too. You can as well. Draw encouragement, they write, from these past examples of faithfulness. But I think the central question in this text and actually in this letter is not about their struggle whether to convert back to Judaism or to remain Christian. I think there's a deeper, more universal and human question that can relate to us at this time in our collective life as well that we can mine from this text. As I read through this, an uh, unspoken question that had been on my heart for a while suddenly snapped into focus. And the question was, how do you go on when you feel like you're losing the fight? How long do you keep pursuing God even when all you're met with is silence or what feels like absence? How long are you supposed to hang in there? 
As I said, I've, I've been wrestling with this question for a while now, something that I didn't even know how to fully articulate. It's something that I think is probably on most of our minds this morning, because let's be real, life is hard, and life has been particularly hard in the last few years for all of us. We live in an age of disruption and change, an age of transition, the messy scuffle between periods of relative quiet in history. In our time, whole edifices of what we knew to be true and to be real, what we could believe in and put our trust in, are shearing off and falling away, and the future feels ragged and uncertain. The world we thought we knew is actively changing under our feet, and it is objectively very hard to look around the world right now and feel as if all of our collective efforts or our prayers or our hopes for justice and peace have been successful. It's easy to wonder, are we making an impact at all? And it's not just a collective thing. It can be incredibly daunting to face these own questions within the context of our own lives, how we're relating to our family members or our friends or meeting the goals that we had for ourselves in life if we're finding meaning. Sometimes it simply feels rational to be hopeless, to feel alone, and to simply want to give up. It's the question that uh, Isaiah writes later in, in his text. He says, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake in your presence. How often have you been in a period in your life where you just pleaded with God to be real, to be tangible, to be something that could be touched or sensed or felt, just to be there. And that's not always the case. I believe that this fundamentally, this ache, this feeling, is what the author of Hebrews is speaking to in the Christian community that they're writing to. So I encourage you to get your bulletins out and uh, to turn to that passage in Hebrews, and I, I want to go to that text together, and I want to focus on the first half of that entire passage. The author writes, you have not come to something that can be touched, a blazing fire, darkness, gloom, a tempest, the sound of a trumpet, and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that not another word be spoken to them. If this doesn't mean anything to you in its original context, realize that all of these things, the fire and the earthquakes and all of those awe-inspiring encounters are often the touchstones that the people of Israel looked back to to sense when God was there, right? This was the hook that they could hang their hat on. This was the proof that God showed up for them, that God was present, that God cared, that God was invested in their life and was on their side. Speaking for myself, I think subconsciously, this is the way that I so often want God to show up for me. I want the booming voice. I want the earthquake, I want the fire, I want the burning bush, I want something just for a moment to dispel all of my doubts and my uncertainties and my worries. I'm longing for the days when God was real, when God in the pillar of fire and smoke would fight God's enemies and make everything right, something applicable. The ache behind that question is just show me that you're there. Show me that I'm on the right place, on the right path. And it's this next part, going, going back to the text from Hebrews, that sort of hit me squarely between the eyes. I was reading this on my phone uh, the other week on the subway, and I read this second part, and it just broke me. The author writes, But you have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to the innumerable angels in festal gathering, to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, to the God who is the judge of all, to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. But you have come. This verb here in the Greek, it's in the perfect tense. And if you don't remember high school English class, the perfect tense signifies an action that is completed. Not you will come, or you should hope to come, you might come, you have come. 
This passage, I believe, is a bit of a purposeful bait and switch on the part of the author here. They dangle that which is familiar, that which our rational mind thinks is the presence of God, right? The fire, the signs, the miracles, the things that we read about in the Bible. And we dream of God saving us or showing up in this way, and we get so attached to this image. But then the author pulls back the familiar and gives us something deeper. It's as if they write, do you really think that the pyrotechnics and the special effects are the real thing, the whole point here? In the end, are you actually looking for God, or are you just looking for a display to to dispel your doubts? What I'm asking myself today, what I, I think this text is asking of us is, how often do we discount that which is real in our spiritual lives simply because it doesn't feel imminent or visible? How many times do we fail to see the presence and provision of God for us because we're so attached to that image that we had about how God was going to show up? How often do my own preconceptions of who God is and how God acts in my life blind me to God's presence now and here? How often am I so focused on the fire and the gloom and the earthquake that I fail to see the manna laying right in front of me on the road? The answer that comes to me in this text, the answer that answers the question I posed earlier, is this. No, we don't have the burning bush, and no, we haven't come to Mount Sinai, and we don't see the cloud and the signs. We've come to a different age, to a different time. For us, we're given bread for the journey. We're given signs of Christ's presence among us here, one another to travel with. We keep going because we understand that in the end, we're not playing for final outcomes. The end is settled. Rather, our job as a church is not to usher in the kingdom, but to guard people's souls and to keep our own, to limit the damage along the way as God undertakes the work of reconciliation and healing through us. We are not failures if we don't see it finished. In fact, all we are called to do is simply to hand off the baton, pass the torch to another so that they might be faithful in their own day. This is the promise that we are given in our hard times, in our lives, that we are called to hard work, but we are not abandoned. Early on in Hebrews 12, when the author is going through that entire genealogy of faith, you know, by faith, Abel offered a sacrifice. By, Abraham, by faith, Abraham offered up Isaac. In the end, the author there writes, they did not achieve the thing or realize the thing that they were promised. They kept going, though. And because of their faithfulness, We are here today, and may it be said the same of us one day later on down the road. The answer in the text for me is that the real presence is on the road when I feel most alone, and that the glory and the signs and the thunder and the miracles that truly land, that truly mean something, happen only in the quiet of my own hearts when I least expect them. The bread for the journey is on the path before us, not waiting for us at the destination. In the end, it is this resolve, knowing that we have come, that our life is hid with Christ in God, that we are securely in the palm of God's hand, that then gives us the confidence, the holy hope to risk it all, to serve when we would rather hoard, to give when we would rather keep, to care when we would rather just resign ourselves to apathy. It is this hope, this hope alone, that empowers us to be the church, to be the body of Christ for people. We're not given just a memory or a tradition or a symbol. We're certainly not given a Cecil B. DeMille film. No, instead, we are given a real God for real life, a God who is with us in it. Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us give thanks by which we offer to God an acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For indeed, our God is a consuming fire. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.